so you were a derivatives trader, then you became a restaurateur, and then a software entrepreneur, which makes you, I think, a complete renaissance uh, man here on the oh, show. Yeah. I want to start with the, the booking platform that you built. You were in the restaurant business. I understand that Open Table is absolutely hated by restaurateurs, second only to Yelp in terms of contempt. That is probably yes. accurate. Yes, you've done your research. That is about yeah. accurate. Yes. And, and you and I both grew up in the restaurant business. We're both Greeks, if people couldn't tell from the last names. My name is actually with K's as well. But you grew up, either your dad or your uncle's owned restaurants. I, uh, if you grew up in Chicago, man, you know Greeks. Greek yeah. cousins. There's always Greek cousins that have a restaurant somewhere or whatnot. I definitely did not really grow up in the business, mm. but I was always, it was like one, it's yeah. one Kevin Bacon away from, you know. Yeah. I yeah. literally grew up in it. You didn't work in the in the restaurants of your uncle's I never did. Um, yeah. The first day I worked in a restaurant was the day we opened Alinea, which is pretty crazy. And you came to the restaurant business uh, with the knowledge that every single person you talked to said, this is the worst business. Do not go into the restaurant business. And then you made the top restaurant in the country. Tell us how that came about. Yeah, it was, I mean, that's for sure true. And I, I spent over a decade as a derivatives trader, loved it, started investing in the internet as an angel investor in 1996 and had just a diversity of interests. I studied philosophy in college. And when well, I grew up in a home where my mom, wonderful woman, great mom, terrible cook. And so- Wait, I, so your dad I, was the Greek in the family? Correct, yes. Yeah, so he cooked, and, he had, like my dad, he had uh, cooking duties. Yeah, but he was busy too, uh, right? And he also didn't want to offend my mom and all that. So there's a lot of complexity there, but yeah, just suffice it to say, I grew up, um, I grew up a very picky eater. Hmm. And it wasn't until I met my, my wife and, and her family who are ethnically Latvian, who are very Euro, and love good wine, good food, trying new things, trying new cuisines, trying ethnic cuisines, all that. And it was genuinely, at 22 years old, it was terrifying for me. And that's the irony of this. It's often the people who I think didn't have exposure to something that become the most passionate about it, whatever mm. it may be, because you're exposed to it at a point where you're like, how did I miss this for the first 22 years yes. of my life? And so I started doing what I always do, which is I started reading books, MFK you know, Fisher and, and Ruth Reichel and all these kinds of great writers. There was a renaissance of food writing in the early 2000s. Mm. And I started Anthony reading all Bourdain, that. Anthony Kitchen Confidential. Yeah, yeah, Michael Rollman, all those, yeah. all those folks. And we, we traveled a bit and we, we ate and I got more and more passionate about it. And this is all, my wife will always laugh because this is all her doing. Um, and, and I get somehow the credit for it. But it really was her doing in that it exposed me to all these wonderful experiences. And then um, we went one day to lunch at Trio Restaurant in Evanston and Grant Ackett's had taken over there. And um, it was just different. It was better than almost anywhere we'd been in the world. Mm. And we'd been very fortunate to eat all over the place. It was 10 minutes from our home. It was in suburban Evanston, which made no sense. And the Whenever you find something like that, it's like finding an indie rock band or something yes. like that, right? Where yes. you go, how does the world not know about this? Right. And you want to immediately I, evangelize it. You can't shut up about it. And you correct. want to go deep. Yes. You want to find all the deep tracks, all the live stuff on YouTube, yeah. et cetera. I remember when I was about 14 years old, I found the jam. And yeah. the cool thing then is that like, you know, some guy's got all the vinyl and you go, oh my God, they've put up 18 albums and you dig through. And this is kind of what I did with, with Grant and, and with the food. And, you know, I didn't know anything about the business really, but I found myself as I would sit down in a restaurant counting chairs and tables and just doing the basic, very basic math. What is the total potential revenue of this place? How many people can they put through? Anybody could do this. This is, you know, back of the envelope sort of modeling. And eventually, um, you know, after going there for about a year, I, I asked him, you know, what are your goals? What, what do you want to be doing? Hmm. Um, and I had backed some, like yourself, I had backed some small angel startups. And that's often the first question I ask when I do. Um, and Is what? What's the goal here? What way do you what, see it in yeah, 10 what's, years? Not, not, what's, not even what's the goal for the business. What are your goals? Hmm. Like, what do you want with your life? Um, because this may or may not be a good fit for you, even though you're the one creating it. And, um, you know, he was very, very singularly focused on 
I grew up in a diner. When I was four years old, I started cooking eggs. I worked for Charlie Trotter for eight weeks. I hated oh, wow. the environment there. He quit. Trotter told him, you'll never amount to anything. He got in a car, drove to the French Laundry. Thomas Keller was his mentor. But then he had this experience where he, he just worked for three days at El Bulli when Fran Adria was there in Spain, in Rosa's Spain, and saw like, oh my God, like I can take these traditional techniques and apply them in ways that are emotionally resonant with people in a totally different way. The rules get cast aside. And so as a young chef, this was very liberating for him. And, and we found him at that moment, like he was 26, 27 years old. He was given control of his first kitchen. And I just said to him one night, you know, what do you want to be doing? And it'll probably not be here, I'm guessing, in the long run. And if you ever want to do something, I'd like to help you build a restaurant for yourself. And he asked me what kind of restaurant I wanted to build. And I said, how should I know? I've never built a restaurant before. <laughs> and that was it. Like literally two weeks later, we, we started planning for what became millennia. And a year to the date of that conversation, we opened, which is cra genuinely crazy. Everyone along the way, to answer your question in a long, verbose way, everybody I knew said, okay, yeah, you made a bit of money. Don't flush it down the toilet with a restaurant. Did you make the money from the angel investments in the dot-com era? Was um, there any big winner in that? Yeah, there was one big winner in that, which was FunBrain.com, which was a children's entertainment website, which ah. I invested in at 90, 1997 when it um, was doing you know a couple hundred thousand page views a day. And our options trade, uh, our options software guys that I found and hired, um, hi Mike Sirks and Paul Hudson, um, yeah. they uh, they um, made this this game up, math baseball for his wife's fourth grade um, class, and all of a sudden dial ups. You know, this is dial modem days from around the country started going it going to the site, even though they weren't advertising it outside of her classroom. Wow. So um built that up um and sold it as part of the family education network, which was a two hundred and seventy-five million dollar purchase by Pearson PLC. I was the only person yeah. that had a say a vote in the matter that voted against that because I remember some greeting card company sold for five hundred million dollars. I remember right that. Before. Yeah, yeah. What was that company? Of, it was Excite it was at Home. Something Mountain Greetings. Oh, or something Blue like Mountain. That. And yeah. I was just like, uh, and we had like, we had 8 million students signed up and millions of teachers and all this sort of thing. And and at the, the metrics of the days, as you know, were eyeballs. So I was like, but we have more eyeballs than them. <laughs> hey, everybody. It's time for another R Crowd deal of the week. Right now, you can join R Crowd's investment in. Boat Setter. According to the deal memo, Boat Setter is the largest and only insurance backed boat rental marketplace that connects owners, renters, and licensed captains. Boat Setter's revenue grew 100% year over year, and more growth could be coming with 12 million private boat owners in the U.S., according to their deal memo. Speaking of growth, do you wish you were in early on some of the best performing IPOs? of 2019 and 2020 well our crowd investors were and now you can join them with our crowd accredited investors can invest directly easily and most importantly early like i do as an angel investor our crowd investors have benefited from our crowd companies ipoing like beyond meat and lemonade or being bought by companies like intel nike microsoft oracle and uber so here's your call to action our crowds accredited investors have already invested over $1 billion in growing tech companies. If you're an accredited investor, you can join our crowd for free. O-U-R-C-R-O-W-D.com slash twist and review the current deals. There is no payment involved until you invest. That's rcrowd.com slash twist to sign up for free.